Yeah, welcome to the second lecture of the fourth week of this course human molecular genetics. The previous lecture we looked into uh, the approach that we normally use for cloning genes involved in recessive disease. So, we have looked at the conventional approach what they call as a positional cloning right. So, what is shown here in this uh, slide is a picture of a person who is holding the journal science the issue science appeared in 1989. So, that is the issue that carried the first report of successful positional cloning. So, the gene that they have identified for a condition called a cystic fibrosis and this was found in 1989. So, this is the issue that 1989 issue that carried this story it was like a major landmark in human genetics, human molecular genetics because they were able to identify a gene without really and you know knowing the function of the gene purely based on its position. So, that is a landmark discovery and this approach what we discussed in the previous lecture position cloning you know as since then you know has resulted in the identification of a large number of you know genes implicated in hundreds and hundreds of monogenic disorders. So, it has been nearly 25 years 26 years since the discovery of the cystic fibrosis gene by this approach. And what you see is that uh, you know now still there is a long way to go. So, we are able to now clone the gene involved in a monogenic form, but still it is a long way to go. I wish to show this picture because the person who is holding this issue of science is the same person who whose photograph is in the issue of that particular science because he is Danny who happened to be a patient suffering from cystic fibrosis gene and he was one of the index cases that led to the discovery of this particular gene. So, that is the picture along with the group leader Lap Chi Sui and Francis Colin one of the you know person involved in human genome project initiative along with Jack they you know really celebrated the discovery of the gene using this approach it was so powerful. So, this person now has grown up the handsome individual that you see here is holding that issue and there was a cover page article that appeared in the science journal nature in 2009 to mark the 20 years of you know uh, this approach since the first gene was identified by positional cloning in the two decades a large number of disorders have been dissected, genes have been identified, it is a remarkable you know achievement in a short time, but you know still you know understanding the functions of the gene that are defective in any disease that you identified using post cloning that is still a long way to go. Still you know there are several studies still people are trying to understand the gene and and, and this kind of approach position cloning really helped in prenatal diagnosis and, and in expecting whether an individual in predicting whether an individual would have the disease or not and so on. But really has not changed the way uh, the therapy you know that that part is not at uh, changed dramatically, but really the diagnosis and other things have helped and uh, you know people are able to save many and so on. So, that is the remarkable discovery. What had happened during this period since 1989 to now is is also a revolution in terms of the technologies in terms of the ways by which you are able to analyze the genome. One of the major you know uh, uh, changes that happened during this period is the completion of human genome sequence project. So, in 2000 they have completed the first rough draft of the human genome. There are two issues one that came in science the other one in nature which really detailed the different aspects of our genome, how complex it is, how roughly what could be the number of genes, what are the repeat elements and how the genomes genes are clustered in chromosome, which chromosome has got more number, 
what is there any chromosome specific architecture in terms of genome sequencing. There are many, many aspects that have been discovered using this approach. And what we know is that it has got close to 3 billion bases. In the beginning, you know, people have been expecting there could be a large number of genes that our genome could have. Now, the current estimate is maybe 20 to 25,000 genes, that is the maximum. Still, we do not know all the genes, and on average, you know, per gene it could be 3000 nucleotide and so on. So, what we also know is that, that it could be 99.9 .9 percent similarity between two individuals and then we also share about 90 percent similarity with chimpanzee our predecessors and then less than 2 percent of our genome codes for protein and of course, the largest chromosome, chromosome 1 has got large number of most of the genes and chromosome Y is something that has got the least number of genes. So, these are some of those you know bullets with regard to the human genome that we know. So, as a result now we know uh, you know great deal about our human genome not only about its sequence, but we also know about what are the genes, where they are located, are there any different splice variants and so on. There are beautiful tools available for you people to go and explore. I am just listing two of them. One is the UCSC genome browser and you can see that the website is here and you go and then you will be able to you know understand how the genome is. You simply you know in this region you know in the query box you add any gene that you discussed in this class or anything that you want to understand and then it would show some display like this. What does it really show? For example, if I give a query called EPM2A a gene that I have been working on for more than 20 years, what it would do is that it would display something like this. What it really shows is that this gene is located around this region of this chromosome, chromosome 6. It shows exactly the position where it is and it also shows the cDNA. What is shown here is you know this is exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, exon 4 and then you have different transcripts having alternate promoters, alternative exons and so on. So, it gives you the information. Not only that, it also gives you the similarity sequence wise with the genome of various other animals. For example, rhesus, the genome sequence is compared with rhesus monkey, with mouse, dog, elephant, chicken, uh, xenophus, zebrafish and many other fish right lamprey. What you can see here is that there are segments in the genome that show very high similarity right. Wherever you have exon you have very high similarity, wherever there are non coding sequence you do not see much of a similarity. So, over the time during evolution things have changed between the genomes, but if you compare with the closest species like the rhesus monkey you will find that even in the non coding region where there are introns you see higher sequence similarity that clearly shows the footprint like you know there are regions right. And it also shows what are the repeats that are present see there are repeats called line, sign and so on. So, these repeats are present all over the genome and you can see that there are several regions you have the repeat. So, remember we discussed that you know at times regions of the genes gets deleted and it is recurrent meaning it happens again and again and it could happen because of what you call as non allelic recombination because there are repeat elements and during recombination you know the two alleles have to homologs have to come together and then recombination at times it can you know misalign as a result you could have non allelic recombination. This is something that we dis discussed when we are talking about the different types of mutations. And you can see that where are the regions that are you know having the repeat region and what is known is for example, in Indian population this particular exon of the gene you know gets deleted and, and, and you can see that you know you have repeat elements flanking these exon which may possibly result in such kind of deletion. So, these are some of the information that are you know available. So, if you are you know if you are running a lab or you are doing a research on a particular gene or its mutation. If you found any muta you know deletions, you can immediately go to this genome browser and understand how 
complex that region of the chromosome is. You can look at all these things. So, if you click each one of the you know uh, uh, heading here, it will give you more information and you can analyze. So, that is a very, very powerful you know browser which gives you all the information based on bioinformatic analysis. And you also see here for example, you know there are uh, you, mountains that you see and these are regions where they are looking at the histone modification. You know uh, we talk about chromatin um, change in the chromatin right you know there are uh, for a gene to be active or inactive you know you have the DNA along with the histone protein which forms the chromatin. Now, the chromatin is very compact or very loose it depends on whether a gene in that region should be active or not active and people even looked at what are the regions you have such kind of modifications in the chromatin right and such modification can also be you know modulating the expression of the genes which also you call as epigenetics something that you know is coming up in the field. For example, you know you are uh, although you would be contributing your genome to the next generation and the expression of these genes also depends on what kind of diet you take. If I am a diabetic person the way some of the genes are going to be expressed in the next generation is you know modulated by you know such kind of modifications we believe. So, that is that is another uh, aspect and and all these informations are available in one you know click. So, you know lot of wealth of information available that really helps us to understand our genome. So, I would urge you you go and you know, explore and, and try to find I mean you can compare between different sequences you know different species and you can explore what it is. The another such you know browser that gives you that kind of information is Ensemble. This is from the Europe, the other one is from California, uh, Santa Cruz. This is from Europe which we call Ensemble, Ensemble Genome Browser and again I have given you the site and again it gives you information, very different kind of information. You can go and explore lot of you know uh, interesting aspects that you have in the browser. A large number of aspects that you want to explore, you want to look into the you know how genomes are similar between different species, what are the gene rich regions and so on. And what I am going you uh, giving you is an example for a particular gene, again is a UPNTA gene, I have given that as a query and it gives you beautifully as to how this particular gene is making various different types of transcripts. So, there are transcripts that has got exon 1, some has got alternate exon 1 exon 2 and 3 again is common and then of course, you have various transcript that show you know different kind of um, combinations. So, that is uh, you know is something which is very very important and informative for people who are studying a particular gene. So, now it is all based on bioinformatic analysis and they keep getting data from various publication try to integrate here and then maintain it. So, it really is something that is for anyone and it is a free site. So, you go and explore you will understand lot of uh, you know uh, features about our genome. There are help files, there are introductory topics and you can download many of the papers and really worth going and exploring in these two sites. So, this is what uh, now you know we have discussed positional cloning wherein you know we have uh, discussed how the markers we use to narrow down a region and then you go and look into the genomic fragments rearrange the marker according to physical order then identify genes and so on. This approach is pre genomic before you know uh, the genome sequence was released with this kind of powerful browsers. Now, we really do not need to worry about the physical order of the markers because they are accurately placed in the in the in the genome. So, now you do not need to really worry about it. So, if you are able to narrow down a particular segment of the you know you know region of the chromosome you can straight away go to this powerful sites and see what are the genes that are present here. So, that is what you know this this assembly line of genes discovery post genomic you know uh, era is depicted in this slide. So, you have to of course, start with patients clinical analysis, DNA collections, you have to identify a large number of families and of course, pedigree analysis must without that you cannot do, you have to look into the pedigree you know predict what is the mode of inheritance and of course, go and do the linkage studies take a large number of microsatellite markers spanning all over the autosome if it is autosomal, x chromosome if it is x chromosomal and try to narrow down the region right. Once you are narrowed down 
Now, then you can go identify a region, the genomic segment, then you can go and look at the genome browser just now I described to you. So, you look into the region, what are the genes present, it would tell you what are the genes that are there, right. And then you can identify a candidate for you to go on sequence or you know another you know routine approach people do is to do karyotype. Any abnormality even today you start with a karyotype to see is there any structural change in the chromosome. If there is a change and then mean more than one patient who is affected by the same disease there are identical uh, structural abnormalities likely that you know it is the same structural change that results in the disease. So, you look into where the chromosome breakage happened, translocation happened that gives you a clue which region. So, that also takes you to this particular you know step that is to you know a candidate genomic region again you go to genome browser look at all these things. Then you have to go and identify or select candidates there may be 20 genes, there may be 30 genes. So, you have to you know you know uh, prioritize pick up some. For example, I am looking at a disease that affects the skin. Therefore, you know, the gene I would consider as a candidate, candidate are those genes that are expressed in the skin tissue. If a gene is not expressed in skin tissue, that probability that that may be contributing to the disease is less likely, right. So, but it could be a, even a secretory protein, you know, expressed somewhere, protein is exported, it may act on, you know, particular tissue. So, therefore, you when you want to look into, you know, what kind of protein they could code for and then consider that as a candidate. So, there are several approaches people use to identify a candidates, line them and then do mutation screening. You go and sequence that particular gene in the patient, you know you take one patient for every family and simply you go and screen and for the mutations if you have found you know some mutation then you can you know be confident that that is the you know mutation or that is the gene that is causing the disease. If you can find same gene being defective in multiple families all having the same disease then it, it becomes much more stronger for you to tell this is the gene likely to cause the disease. But at the end of the day you need to validate you know the mutation that you find especially in a dominant disorders where the changes are not like what you see in recessive disease that gene is deleted or nonsense mutation these are you know really loss of function mutations you are certain that that causes the disease. But if you have changes that are changing the amino acid it becomes you know extremely difficult to tell whether that is the gene which is causing the disease. So, you go and do assays for example, you test the protein or its function at the cell level cell biology create animal models like we discussed in mouse or there are more powerful models that are there for example, zebra fish you know fish right that that talks about many of the you know, developmental process if you are looking at congenital problems you can easily screen them using you know zebra fish and so on. And if we can recapitulate by you know mimicking that kind of a change again in the genome of these organisms and you can recapitulate some of those phenotype defect that you see in humans then you become you know far more certain that this is the gene that causes the disease. So, that is how you know these days the genes are being discovered. Uh, genes are being identified for disease and genes are being validated for their role in the disease that you are studying. So, this is uh, the flow chart and you know you can understand how things have changed from simple genomic library you go and do what you call as genomic walking making contact and then cloning the gene. Now, everything is click away once you have done a mapping in you know 30 minutes you can identify what are the genes that are present in that region because of the powerful information that is available to all of us via such kind of browsers that we discussed. So, you go ahead and then look into these browsers that will give you more information. Now, all this information that we talk about whether these are different splice variants whether you know what is the conservation between I said that there are regions that are you know the sequence is very very similar between say a segment of the chromosome of fish with human what does it tell you? It tells you that these are very very important for the function of the gene that is why the sequence did not change much. So, this has come because of you know a new uh, brand of science called as genomics. In fact, this is not only genomics this is called as age of worms 
where you have a field called as genome or genomics which basically study on the you know the genome or the entire genetic makeup of the organism and then you also have what is called as transcriptome this represent all the you know transcribed you know segments of your chromosome and proteome is all the translated product of your you know your body. So, this is what it is. So, what is the difference? The difference is the genome is pretty much a stat, static you know is, you know if you know if I, if I look into my DNA derived from my say skin cell and compare it with for example, my epithelium present in my buckle inside my mouth the DNA is not going to be very different it is going to be pretty much identical. But if I, I isolate the RNA from my buccal you know, epithelium compare it with my skin cell is going to be very very different right. So, the DNA is pretty much static it does not change much with the age or tissue type or anything except immune cells have a very different organization, but other than that you do not really see much of a change. But the RNA which is present you know in a, even in the same tissue with age is going to be different. For example, you look at most of you are youngsters, you look at our skin it will be very you know wrinkle free glowing and so on. Go and look at your grandfather and grandmother it will be wrinkle it will not glowing and one day your skin also would become like that. It happens because of the change that happens in this in the cell and because of the protein that are made because of the RNA that you make because of the genes that express. So, even in a tissue with age there is a temporal change in the expression pattern right it is very very dynamic it can change with time the way the genes are expressed during for example, winter time when it is very cold in the skin cell is going to be different from summer time and so on. So, that is about the transcriptome then you have of course, proteome it is one can say if I have looked at transcriptome why should I look at proteome because I, I know this is the gene expressed therefore, that protein should be there but it is not simply whether a protein is present or not present. It is also whether the protein is functional or not functional. A protein may be there, but not functional. How do you know that? Because of the changes that happens in the protein. Protein gets modified. These are called as post translational modification and these changes are dynamic, more dynamic than your mRNA expression, right. So, therefore, you know there are signaling cascade that happens and there is a crosstalk and then protein becomes functional, non-functional and looking at such kind of changes in the protein that field itself is called as proteome. So, people are looking at various aspects they are looking at the static sequence the genome sequence, but it gives lot of information because it did not change. Now, I can compare different population and see who are more related to me or I can look at the transcriptome the transcriptional status between same tissue, but in different condition and then see what is that for example, infected not infected same tissue I can look into the transcript and see what is changed because of the infection and 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 and, and then decipher whether that change is a cause for the infection or a consequence of it or I can look into the proteome which again would tell you how what is the metabolic activity and how that may change the way my physiology is and so on. So, that is a proteome. So, things have changed people are now looking at global aspect all the sequence all the RNA all the protein and try to understand how that varies and that may contribute to your normal health or you know in disease condition. So, since we are uh, we are talking about human genetics. So, it is most to do with mostly it is to do with the genome therefore, it is called as genomics. So, people study the entire genetic makeup of organisms and then try to you know see if there are changes or changes you know uh, variation within individuals variation between populations and at times between uh, species that would give you some novel insight. This is a new field. So, when you compare the genome sequence with one another and this is called as comparative genomics for example, comparison within the within a genome. I can compare for example, chromosome 1 with chromosome 22 chromosome 1 is very big chromosome 22 is very small. So, is there any difference between these two? So, why for example, chromosome 9 often gets deleted and resulting or translocated resulting in particular cancer 
is there anything that is unique to that chromosome that makes it more brittle than any other chromosome. So, I can look into the genome you know of a particular species within the genome I can understand and, 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 and extrapolate or I can compare between species. Now, I have the mouse genome, I have the human genome, I can compare and decipher why a mouse has got a tail while I do not. Likewise, I can compare between a monkey and the human and see what difference that makes, why you are able to study monkey while monkey is unable to study us, what is that that is given in our genome that makes us the most powerful species on the earth or comparison between individuals, why I am not as bright as my friend, he understand these lectures better than me, while I could not. Is there anything that makes him better because the way the genome is organized, one can look at or comparison between cell state, a normal cell, a cancerous cell, is there anything that happens in the genome that results in the cancer formation. We know that there are the changes in the genome that results in the cancer. And then you can integrate all the information, we can for example, look into different species, there are species of animals that, that, that are known to have cancer, that are not known to have cancer, they never get cancer, but humans we get cancer. Is there anything that is their signature in our genome that makes us susceptible or at risk of developing cancer, we can study or we can study even how variation in the genome may contribute to cancer or how change in the genome even within an individual certain tissue some change happens as a result you have cancer. So, you can integrate this information and try to understand how the genome may contribute to a particular you know uh, property that you are looking at. That is why it is important that you do not just restrict your you know sequence analysis only with the human. So, you have of course, the human genome sequence announced that came out in science, but you have many other species that have been sequenced now. You have mouse, we have rat, people have sequenced the chicken genome, it has gone on. There are now sequences available even for panda, the, the, the species that is so unique to China. So, they have sequenced and so on. So, that gives you an understanding as to how you know the sequence may contribute to certain unique qualities of the species or even to understand how they evolved and this we can even have some medical relevance. That is where the you know sequencing projects have gone on beyond you know human, they looked at mouse, rat, chicken and so on and, and, and go on to you know understand our genome. The genome is very complex as I told you it is you know only 10, 2 percent of our genome or less than that may have the gene sequence or regulatory sequence some functional you know form the remaining is so called non coding DNA. We really do not know what is the message that this DNA sequence carry, certainly they should have some function otherwise it would have been lost right. So, they are there because they have some function we do not know. So, one of the biggest uh, contributions of the comparative genomics is to identify certain messages that are hidden in the genome sequence, because these are sequence certain signatures we do not understand unless you compare. For example, we am just some hypothetical sequence given for the same segment of the chromosome between human and mouse. If you look at it, it would be very difficult for you to understand what is there, is there anything similar between these two, is there anything that is not similar between these two, it is extremely difficult. But if you carefully analyze, you could find certain you know signatures that are identical, something hidden there right that really helps. So, this is possible only when you compare two different sequence. If you do not compare such kind of signatures that are common between two species, you are going to miss out. That is where the comparative genomics really help and how these are not coding sequence, these are sequence beyond the coding sequences and they may have a regulatory role in, in modulating the way the, gene, the genes are expressed or modulating the way the genomes are expressed. So, this comparison between the genome sequence of various animals model systems with human gives you some understanding as to how the signatures are possibly conserved and what could be the function of this. So, but you need to validate that is where model systems really really help. So, what is shown here is such kind of comparisons you know is a, a 
the upstream regulatory sequence of a gene for example SOX B this is a gene here what they have done is uh, you know region that is um, beyond the SOX uh, B2 coding sequence they compared between different species between human zebra fish amphioxus this is one of the primitive vertebrates and then many other like for example echinoderm and many other lower species. So, what they have done is they looked at the sequence they compared and you can see there is a segment which is you know very highly conserved the peak here represent that you know similar sequence and the distance is also very critical this is where your gene sequence is you can see the coding sequence is conserved in all because coding sequence are expected to become you know conserved because they have to code for the protein the codon has to be maintained. But what is interesting here is that downstream of that you know you still have certain sequence is not coding, but they are very very critical. Now, you can what you can do is that you delete this region in the genome and then see whether the development because this gene is involved in development and it is affected for example, in, in any of the uh, developing uh, model for example, you can use zebra fish and then show whether that changes and even people have tried to swap it for example, use the human DNA sequence over there and see whether it is able to drive that gene. And this is what is shown here beautifully in this paper you can go and look into as to how you know comparative genomics helped us to identify a certain controlling element and how the model systems helped us to understand what is the function of them. So, now it is very very uh, obvious for us if this is one of the genes defective in a disease now what you will do you will not restrict your mutational screening only to the coding sequence. Now, you know this this region that is present downstream of the gene is very critical for its function. So, now I would also look for mutations therein. So, if there is this region is deleted maybe the gene does not express. So, that is how such kind of analysis gives you a power you know in in deciphering how changes in the genome can alter the way the gene function and how they may contribute to the pathology. So, the human genomics not restricted only to disease that is only when you are not well or having a disease that I am going to bother about you. This goes beyond you know disease we also look at wellness like why you are so successful as homo sapiens as compared to our predecessors right. I am going to talk about one such example which really helped us to understand how we became so powerful species. This is by looking at the genome and comparing it with a property that is skull volume. So, if you look into you know our uh, closely related primates you, you look at gorilla or look at orangutan many other species they are really really mighty they have a huge head and they are very physically so good and you would assume that they have large brain because they have a big head, but that is not the case. If you really compare the skull volume relative to the brain size, we will find that the homo sapiens that is the humans we have the largest volume as compared to our closely related species. Why? It is because of this particular property. So, what we are shown here is the skull of two different species on the left is the homo sapiens the human on the right you have one from apes right. The skull is big, but what is you can note here is that that on either side of the skull you have a huge cavity right. As a result the inner space available for the brain is compromised in the skull of the apes. Why you have the cavity? Because they have very strong powerful jaw and for the jaw to function it, it connects the lower jaw with the skull with a set of muscles which gives the ape the primates the strength. So, they can even crack a coconut with their jaw that is something that we lost basically as a result you know our skull you do not need to have a pocket like the apes to have the muscle attached to that and possibly we have lost I mean we do not know for sure, but that is what we believe and as a result you can occupy the skull with more volume of the brain and this you know kind of suggestion came from again comparative genomics. So, people have this uh, nature issue in 2004 carried an article which showed how for example, the myosin gene the one that you know uh, protein that uh, is rich in 
in the muscle tissue undergone a mutation like what you see here. You can see that this is the you know human and all other monkey species that are shown here and, and these are non-human right. So, you can see that there is a change that really you know altered the way the protein functions and as a result probably it has become weak and it allowed the skull to enlarge and you have a larger brain that probably helped us for example, to come up with tools to take care of our compromised function. Maybe we are unable to you know uh, cut open anything with our jaw, but we can make tools and break them and so on. So, this is again an example to show how for example, this you know human brain is able to you know allow the, uh, the human skull is able to occupy or allow a larger brain to be present in almost same kind of skull. So, this is a kind of an example which tells us that maybe we lost the strength of our jaw, but as a compromise our skull now allowed a larger brain to be located as a result you know we are able you know we can think very differently. We have the ability now to make tools and take care and probably we have evolved the way we are now. So, that is also talks about how we evolved from maybe from our predecessors, but the genome sequence also helps us to understand how we evolved as a population. So, this is again a nature publication which talks about the human uh, or the population Indian population how different Indians are as compared to the other and they looked at the genome sequence variation therein. The hypothesis is that we have had two population to begin with one what is called as ancestral North Indian on the northern part of India and now ancestral, ancestral South Indian population and all the population that you say see today or you know or are, are, are all derived from the mixture of these two. So, this is likely the scenario based on such kind of powerful ge genome you know analysis. So, that is that is the kind of you know outcome of such kind of analysis. So, how do you really come up with such kind of suggestions that you know the Indian population had such you know two ancestral population what you call as ancestral South Indian or ancestral North Indian. This has come from the variation that our genome has. Remember like we said that you know each one of us are very different from our you know every other individual right very different we have a unique genetic identity. And this is because of the common variation that our genome has we have you know rich variations in our genome. And these variations not only gives us uniqueness a property, but also can serve as you know important risk factors for common disease. For example, this is a classroom 40 of like you know I have 40 students one of them sneeze in two days like I will see another 10 of them get the cold right why others did not. So, it could be because of the variation in your gene or genome that gives you resistance for some and that may give you susceptibility for some. So, that is that is what we talk about common diseases. So, when you talk about common diseases these are complex disease meaning polygenic your disease is because of multiple genes and each gene has got multiple variants a combination of variant could result in a disease. How that is uh, you know we can we can explain here for example, you have gene A and the gene A for example, could have several different alleles and this could be one of the allele that contributes to a disease. Likewise, you have gene B that could also have several allele this is B and this allele contributes to that. So, when you have more than one gene and one of the allele come together you may have a phenotype and this phenotype is resulting from the contribution from three genes, but this is a simplistic model it could be more than that. In addition that could be environment for example, you know when somebody sneeze there is a bug that is coming to me that is environment. So, I may have a combination of the genes that may give me resistance. On the other hand if I have, have a combination that gives, gives me risk. So, I may or may not develop disease until unless I am exposed to the environment unless the bug comes I am not going to you know express that phenotype. So, that is what we call as a complex disease. So, how do you really you know identify what is the risk factor 
So that is the next challenge that, that we have in human genetics that we are in the crossroad. We have certain technologies already developed, we have certain approaches already devised, but it is not as successful as what we have seen for the monogenic form, right. This is developing maybe in 5 years, 10 years we are going to see several breakthroughs with regard to what are the gene combination that results in common disease. So, we look into some of them, what is the road map, how people are, what is the model and how people are trying to identify this. So, the hypothesis is that the common variants likely to be important for common disease. So, if that is the hypothesis or model, what we need to do? We have to identify the common variants. The common variants could vary from population to population. Therefore, you want to identify common variants for all the populations and then correlate these variations with the disease and see whether these variants contribute to the disease. So, what is so different as compared to the Mendelian form? There too we have looked at genes or DNA and sequence variation there and how it is different from the so called you know complex disease. It is similar in terms of the change in the DNA. So, in either case you have a wild type that is shown here and then you have a mutant or a variant that is shown on the line below. The difference between the common variant and the mutation is you have mutations and these alleles, mutant alleles are seen only in a few individual who are affected or seen in only in the affected family. You do not see it in the normal population. It could be extremely low in frequency. On the other hand, you have variants which you now call as a polymorphism which are present in at least 1 percent of the population. If there is a class of 100 students and if you are looking at an autosome, you are looking at 200 chromosomes of which therefore, at least 2 individuals or 2 chromosomes should carry that variant. It is very, very high frequent and these 2 individuals may be normal. They may have this variant, but still they are normal and that is why you call it as polymorphism, normal variant and so on. So, that is the difference. It is at the end of the day it is the difference in the DNA, but how frequent it is, whether it is restricted to few families that are affected or present in the normal population, you can make the distinction whether it is a mutation or it is a polymorphism or common variant. To, to identify such variants, the so called common variants, which is present at least 2 percent in a population, you know a new uh, consortium like project was initiated that is called as HAP map project. Here the idea is to identify all the common variants across different population. It was initiated in 2002 and this was called as international HAP map project. The, the scope is or the objectives are to determine the common patterns of DNA sequence variants in the human genome and to make this information freely available. That is one of the clear mandate. It is not something like a, you know a company doing this analysis and keeping to themselves. They spent lot of money and made this information available for everybody. So, even a smaller research groups or diagnostic labs can use that information to you know get information and update their research and so on. And then the other objective is to determine 1 million or more sequence variants, large number of them, their frequencies and the degree of association. Like it is not only you identify variants, but you need to tell in which population you have this allele more frequent and which population you have this allele less frequent. That is very important, the frequency. And then to tell their association. So, you may have identified 50 different such variants, right. So, but how they are associated with each other if they are present in the same sample and how they are associated or distinct from one population to the other. So, this is what the objective to fulfill these objectives what they have done is they have selected you know populations from all the three continents Africa, Asia and Europe and they have characterized a large number of individuals. Here you know if you recall the human genome project they did not sequence many individuals, basically 6 individuals they took and different regions of these individuals they sequenced, but for HAPMA project they have done a large scale sequencing you know for especially the coding region of the genes from hundreds of individuals representing each one of the you know population from 
Africa, Asia and Europe. Again there is a you know if you give a Google search called HapMap project, you will go to the site where you can look into the variation. For example, any region of the chromosome we can look at what are the variants known, how different they are in different population that gives um, you know information. One of the major focus of the AppMap project is to identify what is called a single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP or SNP the other way people call it. Why they have done it? Because if you look into especially the coding sequence because we assume that most of the risk factors are possibly around the coding sequence because that may confer some risk for certain disease. Therefore, the coding variants are more important. Therefore, they looked at single nucleotide polymorphism because often you will find a particular base being replaced by other and this new allele is present in, in the normal population. So, the, the, the objective was about 10 million SNPs you know we know now that exist in the human population and they try to understand what are the alleles that are rare and what are the alleles that are you know frequent at least 1 percent. So, 1 percent above is normally considered as risk factor for many of the diseases. So, that they have they were able to map it. Now, we have that information available in the browser if you go to here HapMap project and what is uh, interesting here is that this is what you know something that tells you about the SNP. So, we are comparing say 4 chromosomes chromosome 1, 2, 3 and 4 right. It is sequenced for a particular region of the chromosome and you will find here you know these are sequence that are identical, but, but this particular region you have alleles. The allele could be either C or T right. So, two different alleles that you have, but for another site that are somewhere close to nearby you have again either G or A. Another site again nearby it could be again G or A. Now, when you have three such SNP SNPs close to each other. Now, there you are going to look into you know a condition wherein a given base for example, C may more often than not may associated with G or A and so on right. So, but these are linked to each other. So, if I have to do some analysis I am I expected to sequence every SNP to find what is the variation that is there in my genome? The answer is no. The HapMap project what they have tried to do is they try to look into a large number of such SNP and then they are able to even tell for example, what kind of combination they have G probably more often associated with G, A probably more associated with A and so on. And then they came up with some very informative you know SNPs like what is called as tag SNPs which if I type you know I type this site, this site and this site these three SNPs would tell me what are the other flanking sequence likely that I am I am likely to carry. For example, if I have A, so I am going to have this you know these two right and if I am a G then I am going to have this combination. So, this is something that is called as you know uh, haplotype we described already when you talk about monogenic form there are you know physical linkages there are some alleles they are linked to each other and they segregate as a block that is again is a kind of you know indication here they are segregating together. So, to identify you know what uh, SNP I could have I need not type everything I can type one of them in a block which would sort of tell me what are the SNP I am likely to have. So, that is one of the major you know advancements in the HapMap project they identified what is called the tag SNPs which helped me to identify the region not necessarily every variant that I have to look at it. So, why should I really do this kind of exercise take hundreds of individuals sequence them what is common what is RAN what is the you know haplotype what are tag SNPs what is the use. The hypothesis is that common variants contribute to common disease. So, if I know the variants now I can look into individual that have the disease and then ask the question what are the variants that are more often present these in these individuals. If certain variants are more often present in these individuals as compared to the controls they are likely to be the risk factors that would give me some predictive value right. So, that that can be used for treatment or even you know diagnosis and many other. There are many genes that have been 
you know variation there in already linked to uh, as a risk factor for disease that, that are listed here even before the HAPMAP project come, but this HAPMAP project is you know would certainly help us to take this advancement further. Why do you study SNP? You want to look at the relationship between the disease a given SNP or combination of the you know uh, more often associated with the disease. You even want to you know look at the relationship with other organisms that might help us why we have certain phenotype that is not seen in other relationship with human traits you know you can even for example even behavior can be considered as a trait then we can try to link. So, this need not be something a disease you know being somebody is being more aggressive somebody is being more social somebody is being uh, not that social these are all behavior may be something to do with your you know DNA, but they are not grouped as something abnormal, but still these are tried. So, one can you know correlate them and see whether they contribute. So, what is shown here is that each block probably represent different segments of the you know your genome having different alleles because of the SNPs. Some of them may be involved in diabetes, some of them involved in arthritis, some of them involved in stroke, some of them in asthma. So, when you do these analysis you will be able to identify certain combination that gives you more risk of developing a particular disease. So, that is that is the ultimate goal. So, how do you do how different it is as compared to what we discussed in the previous lecture that is a monogenic form. In monogenic form what we have done is we have compared microsatellite marker a linkage meaning that is present in close proximity to a gene that is defective. So, a marker is segregating in a family always with a with a, an individual who is affected we would assume that marker is present very close to a, a defective gene as shown here right. So, what we shown here is uh, two different families you have a marker and an allele for example, a CA repeat having an allele which is 6 this allele present close to a gene therefore, that is defective therefore, wherever you have the 6 going that defective gene also goes in the next generation and you have the individual who is affected in all three generations. Now, the same marker may be linked again with the same disease gene in another family, but not necessarily the same allele you can see here this is the same marker, but allele that you see here is 5 a different allele and that allele co segregates with the phenotype for sure, but it is not the same allele that you have seen in the other family. So, this is the difference here in the marker is physically linked with the disease that is for the monogenic form, but in a polygenic form where your alleles contribute to the disease phenotype it is very different. You can see here there are uh, three different families let us say the risk factor is allele 6. So, that gives the risk you can see here this individual is affected and this risk factor is contributed to both the you know son and daughter the children and both of them are defective or affected likewise here likewise here and so on right. So, you find that you know this allele 6 you know associating with the disease the same allele it is not the we are not talking about the same marker, but particular allele associating with the disease at times you can have an individual who is having the disease allele but normal like here and here that is possible in polygenic form because we are our model is there are many genes that contribute many alleles of many genes contribute these individuals they may not have inherited the other alleles right. So, therefore, here we are talking about a particular allele that is contributing to the disease that is the distinction major distinction between a linkage of marker that that we discussed in monogenic form with a risk allele that we discuss about in 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 polygenic form. So, how do you go about doing looking at complex disease because you are not looking at one particular marker or a gene running in a family and developing complex disease these are multi, many of them. So, the approach is you group individuals for example, what is shown here is controls the other one is case. So, all the individuals that have a given phenotype for example, I am looking at a disease and the disease is likely that it, it contributed by the disease is contributed by genes, but multiple genes. So, what I do I group individuals having the disease in one basket, then I group 
individuals who are from the same you know population who are of the same age group who are exposed to similar environmental conditions. So, what I am doing is I am removing all other variables I am taking the same ethnic population because more or less the genome sequence would be similar and then I am taking same age group because the disease could be age dependent. So, I am taking age similar age group I am taking similar number of males and females so I pretty much other compounding factors I have sort of you know kept it common between these two. Now, I ask what is the difference between these two groups for the difference in the signatures of certain you know genes with reference to their you know sequence variation. Say suppose I am able to identify a risk factor genetic risk factor or a gene contributing to the risk and look for the variants the alleles the risk factor something like that I am expecting. What I am expecting here is assuming allele 6 is the risk factor you would expect the frequency of this allele present in the so called controls who are the healthy individuals would be very low as you can see there is only one individual who has got allele 6 because this is a risk factor the moment you have you are at a higher risk of developing a disease therefore, the probability that I would have a disease later is higher therefore, I will end up that is why individuals that are having allele 6 are more common in the cases right. You can see that you know majority of the individuals have allele 6 still you have some individual who do not have allele 6 is likely because for them the contribution comes from some other genetic risk factor some other gene some other allele again you may have the same gene same disease right. So, this is the approach people use case control and do what is called association you see the increased presence of certain risk factor in the group the affected. So, that is called as association studies that is the approach currently being used to identify genetic risk factors this is the first step like what we did in monogenic form you map the region of a chromosome and identify a gene there whether that gene contributes to the phenotype is the next step likewise here you have an allele that is linked or associated with the disease whether this is the allele that contributes directly to the disease pathology one has to do a lot of functional studies that is still a long way to go, but this is the current practice to identify the risk factor. I will show you one example which is again probably I have shown you before this is a common variant again a small deletion of a small segment of you know DNA which confer risk for developing you know cardiac arrest right this is something that we you know we spoke about in the earlier class also and you can see that that is you know unique to our South Asian population you can see that all these um, circles that are with yellow color are the populations wherein you have the particular you know variant allele risk allele like allele 6. So, there is a deletion in one of the exons uh, sorry one of the introns that affects the way the gene is spliced. Now, you also have this in, in normal individual it is not that it is not present it is present in 5 percent of the population in, in most of the Indian population 5 percent of the population has got the risk allele, but not all of us develop probably there are other contributory factors, but the, 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 the probability that I would develop the disease you know if I have the risk allele it goes up you know two fold three fold you know four fold in you know increased um, uh, risk of developing the disease and it could be population specific therefore, one need to really understand the sequence variation in various population is very very important because there could be you know changes that happened after you know uh, the population has evolved in a, in a given continent. So, you may be having something unique to your population you can see here you know the HapMap project may not have you know identified this particular allele because in their analysis does not include you know the Indian population. So, we need to come up with our own you know sequence um, uh, analysis it is very important. Another aspect as we, as we discussed uh, you know disease and trite and so on is also something related to treatment that is you know you know now that in your own family one of your um, relatives could have had certain um, disorder disease infection whatever you go to your doctor and the doctor prescribes certain medicine 
and he gets better. You know, another distant relative also goes to the same doctor, he gives the same medicine, he does not really help her. And then after one week he goes back, she goes back to the doctor and says, doctor did not help. What the doctor does? You know, he normally will change the prescription, he will give some other drug. The reason being, not all drugs help everybody. The way we respond to the drug also depends on your genetic makeup, because the drugs after all work in combination with your biological system. So, drug may go and bind to certain carrier protein, drug may go and activate a receptor, drug may go and you know change the way an enzyme functions, it is going to interact with your own biomolecules. The how the biomolecules function depends on what kind of variations you have. A enzyme may be more active because of a change in an amino acid. A receptor may be you know responding to a ligand differently as compared to you know, another individual because there is a variation in the coding sequence of the receptor. Therefore, the way you um, respond to a drug also individual specific. Example is something like the shoes, if you are slippers you want to go and buy in a shop, you know what do you do? You know, the shoe keeper or the, 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 the shop you know owner keeps a large number of you know varieties different sizes and you try out something that fits you and then you pay and then come back. It is not that every pair fits your foot. The same thing happens to the drug, not every drug is as effective as it, it is in another individual, because your genome is unique. So, one of the you know predicted outcome of the genome variation project is to identify the variants that contribute to differential drug response, whether if I am a carrier of a particular variant, then would I respond to the drug the same way as the other person or would I not respond or the drug may be more toxic, you know if I have the drug it has some allergic function. So, that is probably because of the change in the DNA sequence. If I know that I am not to be, I am not the one who would respond to a drug, why I should take the drug? So, if I can pre-screen individuals as you know responders who are likely to respond to a drug or non-responders who will not respond to the drug, then you give the drug only to this particular group who are likely to respond to the drug. The other individuals who know because of the genetic makeup may not respond, you try out to begin with some other drug. So, this is called as a personalized, uh, personalized medicine that is the medicine is customized for your genetic makeup, right. So, that is individual you know uh, uh, centric. So, that may be the future. So, when you are born they will isolate little bit of your DNA, sequence is completely profiled, they will tell okay this guy is likely to develop diabetes, hypertension and likely to, to have a toxic effect for a given drug or may not respond to a drug, this data is available. As you grow up you know you are told you are likely to have diabetes. So, what do you do? You better take care of your weight, better take care of your diet. Therefore, you can minimize the risk of having develop you know developing diabetes or you know you have this data, your doctor looks at the data and tells okay this drug should not be given to him, because he may not respond to that or this may be allergic to him, should not be given. So, they go with more informed um, way what should be given, what should not be given. So, this is the future, we do not know all the signatures that gives you the phenotype that is for every drug who would respond or who will not respond, still we do not know this is an evolving uh, branch of science and this is something expected. So, maybe in your own lifetime you are going to see such kind of revolution which pretty much you know you will carry your chip with you, which has got all your sequence information, the doctor is going to put it in the laptop and is going to say okay you guys have to be careful. So, this, this is something that is expected and this course sort of primes you to become one of the uh, person who may contribute to such advancements and uh, with that little note we are ending this lecture. The final lecture of this course human molecular genetics, we hope uh, you have enjoyed and uh, understood some of the recent advancement in this field of science and if you have any query and doubts you may write to us and also do join in the hangouts, we will be able to discuss. Thanks a lot.